We continue a series tonight in Psalm chapter 119. Tonight we come to Psalm 119 verses 129 to 136. This study has shown us how wonderful and amazing the Word of God is. And I've challenged you to live life by the book. That's the title of this series, Life by the Book. What does it mean to live our lives according to the perfect Word of God? And tonight we come to this section of Scripture, Psalm 119, verses 129 to 136. And I want to think with you about this subject, the wonderful Word of God. The wonderful Word of God. I draw my title from that first verse in verse 129 where the psalmist says the testimonies of the Lord are wonderful. The psalmist has been talking for quite some time about the awesome wonder, the joy of the Word of God. And so what does that look like in your life and what does that look like in my life? If we're going to live life by the book, we must know and we must remember that God's Word is marvelous, amazing, and Wonderful. Listen to what the commentator Warren Wearsby said about the Word of God. He says, People obey the Word of God for different reasons. Some because their fear of punishment, others to secure blessings, and still others because they love God and want to please Him. The psalmist stood in awe at the wonder of God's Word, its harmony, perfection, practicality, power, and revelations. Wearsby says, The longer I read and study the Bible, the more wonderful it becomes. And a God who wrote a book that wonderful deserves my obedience. To obey the Word is to become part of that wonder, to experience the power and spiritual transformation in our lives. And church, believer, follower of God, I want you to know tonight, the Word of God is absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. Let's read the text of Scripture tonight. Psalm 119, begin with me in verse 129. The testimonies, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Remember tonight the power is in the perfect word of God to change our lives and transform us from the inside out. When I say the word wonderful, it probably doesn't mean the same thing that you think of or the same thing that we think of or the way we use the word typically these days. When we use the word wonderful, we we use it in this way. Well, uh, your, your daughter comes home from school and she says, Mommy, Mommy, I, I made an A on the pop quiz in math today. And you look down at your precious little child and you say, Sweetheart, that is wonderful. That's the way we use the word. Uh, another way we use the word is um, the mechanic calls and says, Hey, I told you the repairs were going to be kind of expensive, but in fact, it's not as bad as I thought. I've saved you a few hundred dollars and you would say that is wonderful. That's wonderful. Or here's another way we use the word. You're driving on a long road trip and the car's full of children and it's raining outside and you get a flat tire and pull off on the side of the road and your hands are on the steering wheel, your head sinks down and you say, wonderful. You ever been there? Oh, that's just great. Wonderful. Of course, you're using it sarcastically in that regard, right? Well, see, that's the way we use the word today. But the psalmist means something entirely different. It's kind of like the way we use the word awesome today. There are very few things that are really awesome. Everything can't be awesome. There are very few things that inspire awe and wonder. And the psalmist says the word of God is one of those things. Things. I mean, imagine as you look out over the Grand Canyon, the awe and the wonder and the majesty. The word literally means 
marvelous or astonishing. That's what the Word of God is, remarkable or extraordinary. And so why is the Word of God so wonderful? Well, I'm glad you asked. And that's why you're sitting in a building tonight that's 100 degrees, because you want to know why the Word of God is so wonderful and remarkable. And I'm going to answer that question. Now, this morning, we had five sermon points. And tonight, we have seven. So I hope you brought a brand new pen, okay? A lot of writing. First of all, the Word of God is wonderful. We find this in verse 130 because it imparts insight. It imparts insight. It gives wisdom to those who follow the Lord and those who desire to know Him. What does the Bible say there in verse 130? The unfolding of your word gives light. The light of the word of God shines into the darkest recesses of our heart and reveals to us who we are and what we need from God and how we need to adjust our lives according to his word. As God speaks, the word opens up and sheds light into the darkness. And the truth is, the reality is in your life and in mine. The Word of God has shed its light in some very dark places in your heart and some very dark places in my heart. The, the, the light means to give wisdom and understanding. The Bible talks often about the light of the Word of God. And look at what it says. It imparts understanding to the simple. You, you might want to circle that word in your Bible, the simple. You know what the word means. It means those who are foolish. Those who lack understanding. Now, as I first read that, I agreed. Man, I'm so grateful. The world is full of simple people. And we need the word of God to give wisdom to those people who are simple. And as I thought about that, God began to, to do a work in my heart. And he began to remind me, you are one of those simple people. And you're one of those people that need a work in your heart, a work in in your life, do you remember how deceived you were? How dark your eyes were? How far astray you were when God's grace rescued you and found you and redeemed you? Those who are simple, who are foolish, stray away from the Word of God, but God shines His light and gives us understanding. That's the remarkable nature of the Word of God. We need light. You see, I'm one of those simple folks. And so are you. I mean, I, I don't want to insult you. I'm actually using the word simple. There are some worse words, you know. I don't want to insult you, but we desperately need the wisdom of God's word to shine this light in our heart and in our lives. We desperately need it in our relationships. We need it in our families. We need it in our marriages. We need it in our churches. We need it in our government. God, help us. We need his wisdom and understanding. We need his light. The Hebrew word here for unfolding is a very interesting word. Right there, the, the first two verses in verse 130, the unfolding of your word. It's remarkable. You see, in those days, uh, they didn't live in houses like you and I live today. They didn't have light switches where you just walk into the room and you flip a switch and light comes on. In fact, at this time, many of God's people dwelled in tents. Their, through their history, they would dwell in tents in temporary dwellings. And they would take them up and they would move along and they'd place them down. And those tents, they, they weren't the ones that you get at Bass Pro Shop, okay? They, they weren't the tents that you could buy at Walmart that were, you know, kind of mesh and real thin, nice and breezy. And you could see the sun when it comes up. They're made of animals' flesh. And so what would happen? The first thing in the morning is the sun would rise, the tent would still be dark, but as they opened the flap on the tent, what would happen? The light would shine in, it would let everyone know it's time to wake up. Now I want you to notice the picture that the Bible is giving us here. The, the word for unfolding is very similar to the word revelation in the Hebrew. And so what's God saying happens? As we open the word, unfolding its pages, as we open the word, the light of God's revelation shines into our lives. That's why the word of God is so wonderful. Because as you turn these pages and study, you are reading the precious, sacred truth from God himself. That is wonderful. This 
book is unlike any other book on any shelf, in any library, in any location. This book is the sacred, precious, perfect Word of God. Oh, that's wonderful. The Word of God is so remarkable. It is so wonderful. God's Word brings light. You you know what that means. God's Word just brings light. When I need direction, His Word gives me light. I know where to go. You know what else it means? When my heart is dark, the Spirit of God comes and exposes the light of His Word and shows me the areas of my life that I'm trying to hide from God and hide from others. He exposes it. That's conviction. The Word of God is wonderful. It imparts insight. It gives us understanding. Number two in verse 131, it leads to longing. The Word of God leads to longing. Let me tell you this. The longer you spend in the Word, the more time you spend studying the Word, the more years you spend learning the Word, guess what happens? There's never a moment in your life when you feel like you've mastered the content of the Bible. Your desperate desire is that the Bible masters you and you realize how much you still have to learn. And as you study the Word, memorize the Word, meditate on the Word, grow in the Word, learn the Word, you have a desperate desire to know it and to live it and to read it and to study it even more. That's the remarkable thing about the Bible. Now, I've read a lot of books. More books than I really wanted to read, okay? I've read a lot of books. In seminary, each class would have like 7,384 books that you had to read in a certain amount of time. I mean, that's what it felt like. That might be a little bit of pastoral exaggeration, okay? But that's what it felt like. So many books to read, books that I wanted to read, books that I didn't want to read. And these days, I like to, I like to read as a discipline. It's not a joy of mine. But a lot of those books on my shelf that I've read, they're, I could name maybe five or less that I've read more than once. Because once I've read it, I've read it. Once I've read it, I mean, I know what's going to happen. I know the end. I know what he's going to say. I know the author's points. But the Bible is so much different than that, isn't it? The more you read the Word, the more you study the Word, the more you know the Word, the more you want to read, want to study, and want to know. Look at what the Bible says. I open my mouth and pant because I long For your commandments. What's the psalmist saying? I am desperate for the word of God. Like like a person who is suffocating is desperate for air. He wants the word. Like a person who's dying of thirst in the desert, longs for water. He wants the word. Psalm chapter 63 and verse 1. What does the psalmist say? So God, you're my God. I long for you. Look what it says. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I want God's word as much as a man in the middle of the desert wants water. That's what the psalmist is saying. Knowing the wonderful word of God leads to a longing. Job says in Job 23, 12, I've treasured the words of God more than than my portion of food. I want God's word even more than I want breakfast. That's what Job said. Powerful. Our dog has been alive now for 11 years. We got her just after we got married. And she's a great dog. She's a black lab. One thing about her, the one thing for for whatever reason I've never been able to train her is just to stay put. And I guess it's just the inquisitive nature of that breed of dog. I mean, I've trained her to do all sorts of things. I've told you before. I say go dogs and she barks. I mean, she's just a well-trained dog. She'll hold a biscuit on her nose and drool will be, you know, hitting the floor because that biscuit, she's just looking at me, waiting for me to tell her when she can get the biscuit. I mean, there, I can look at her at any moment and say, Sky, go to bed. And she'll get up and she'll go to her bed. I mean, she's just a good dog. I thought kids were going to be as easy as training dogs. They're just not. They're not. But this summer, we were riding out at Stephanie's mom. She's got a few acres down in Elko, in the south part of the county. And we were riding a, a go-kart or a four-wheeler. And Sky just, I mean, she was just running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'd put her inside. Somebody would walk outside, and she'd come back outside. She's a black lab. It's 1,000 degrees in middle Georgia in the summer. And all of a sudden, we get back, and she's just panting. And I, I seriously thought she was going to die. She had a heat stroke. If you've ever seen an animal with a heat stroke, they can't catch their breath. She's just, I mean, we thought she was going to die. 
So what I did is I grabbed her and I, I put her, she's got, Mima has a little fountain in front of her house. So we tried to put her in the fountain and she didn't, the dog, if we got up and wanted to get on the go-kart again or the golf cart or the four-wheeler, you know what she'd have done? She'd have hopped right up again and started running back and forth after us till her heart exploded. I mean, this is a dog that would chase a tennis ball for 12 months at a time. That's just the way she is. She was desperate. If we hadn't done something, the dog would have died. The psalmist is saying he is so desperate for God's word. He wants it more than anything. You get the picture when he says, I long, I long for your word. Look at it. I open my mouth and pant like that dog that's near death. Desperate for air, desperate for water. Why? Because I long for your commandments. That is a deep desire. What does Jesus say in Matthew 5, 6? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's the promise? For they shall be filled. They shall be satisfied. The only satisfaction for a thirsty soul is found in the person of Jesus Christ as revealed in the word of God. Hey, this world is thirsty. This world is thirsty. And they are going all over the place, drinking from fountains that only make them thirstier. Jesus Christ, as he says to the woman at the well, is the water of life. He satisfies. The word of God imparts insight. It leads to longing. Number three, it leads to love. Look what the Bible says there in verse 132. The psalmist talks about those who love the Lord. He expresses his desire to experience grace. Look at what he says. Turn to me. Be gracious to me as is your way. Circle this phrase with those who love your name. How do you see that? What's happened in his life? You want to know what's happened in the life of the psalmist? The more he's been in the word, the more he's learned to love God. The more he loves God, the more he gets in the word. The more he gets in the word, the more he loves God. The more he loves God, the more he gets in the word. We could be here all night doing this. The psalmist is saying, hey, I have grown to long and love the word of God. As a result, I've studied and poured over its pages. And now, I am grateful. I love God. The name of the Lord. To love the name of the Lord. The name. Why does he say, I love your name? The name represents all of who God is, his nature and his character. He loves God. He loves the Lord. Turn to me and be gracious. So he understands God. So he he says, I love the Lord. And he's desperate for God's grace in his life. When you get to know God, you want to know something? You get to understand how good and gracious he really is. God, you grow to learn and see how faithful and loving he really is. Turn to me. Be gracious. God, do a work in my life. Send grace to me. The word of God leads. It's wonderful. It's remarkable. It leads to love. You know, this is the way a relationship is supposed to work. Couples, when they get married, they think they know each other and they think they love each other. Right? I've done a lot of premarital counseling, okay? And couples, when they walk into my office, there's two things they're sure about. They're sure they know each other, and they're sure they love each other. They know everything that they want to know about each other, and they love each other as much as they're ever going to love them. And one thing that I want to tell them, I want them to walk into the marriage with eyes wide open. And here's what you're going to learn a lot more about each other. And as you learn a lot more about each other, the natural result of that ought to be growing to love each other even more. Husbands, I thought you would say amen a little louder than that. It is getting hot in here, isn't it? (laughs) I'll say it again. The more you learn about each other, the more you ought to love each other. All right. Some of y'all are still a little slow on that. Let me tell you why. Not because you discover that your spouse is perfect. And everything you ever needed to know, you already knew. I mean, of course, you knew before you got married. When they wake up in the morning, their makeup's already on. And they don't have bed head and their breath doesn't stink. You know, you knew all that before you got married, right? You, you knew all the ins and the outs. Of course, you didn't. you didn't. You didn't know what you were expecting. But here's the thing. The more you grow to know one another, you love each other in spite of each other's faults. 
That's a deeper love, isn't it? And when you come to the Word of God, the more you grow in your relationship with God, you're going to understand this is a God, and this is the Word that doesn't have any faults. The more that I see Him, the more I love Him. The more I love Him, the more I know Him. And the more I know Him, the more I want to know Him and love Him. It's a beautiful thing about the Word of God. It leads to love. Not just a love for God, of course, a love for others as well. Number four, the Word of God is wonderful because it steadies my steps. It steadies my steps. The word of God is wonderful. It imparts insight. It leads to longing. It leads to love. It steadies my steps. The psalmist says here, keep steady my steps according to your promise. There's a similar thought in Psalm 17 and verse 5. Psalm 17 and verse 5 where the psalmist says, My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. The Bible never says that God will always lead you on a smoothly paved, straight, and easy path. In fact, doesn't Jesus say something to the opposite? Doesn't he say that narrow is the way, treacherous is the path, winding and curving? In fact, if you follow God's people, what you'll notice is that most of God's people in the Old Testament and the New are not walking an easy path. They're following a difficult path. But notice, God might call you to walk a difficult path, but He's the one who steadies your steps in the midst of the mess. That's the goodness of God. What's the psalmist say? Keep steady my steps according to your promise. And let no iniquity get dominion over me. Look at that. God, as I walk according to your word, as I follow you, as I'm obedient, Lord, no matter where you call me to go, no matter where you ask me to step, steady my steps according to your promise. What's the promise? We just read it in Psalm 17. He will not let my foot slip. No matter where he's called you, if he's called you to it, he will see you through it. Hey, that's not in my notes, but it's pretty good. If he's called you to accomplish it, you're invincible until you finish the task that he's given you to do. You know that? God is not done until he's fulfilled his purpose in you. Philippians. He steadies our steps. And notice what he says. Keep steady my steps according to your promise. And let no iniquity get dominion over me. And this is what he means. He doesn't mean that you'll never have problems. That life will always be easy. Or even if it's difficult, you'll never stumble. What he means is this. That when God calls you to something, he will enable you to accomplish it. And not let sin dominate your life. Look what it says. Let no iniquity have dominion. The word dominion there is the same word in the Hebrew. It leads to our word autocratic rule. That's what it means. See, for some of you in your life, in your marriage, in your family, at your job, in your personal life, the problem that you're facing is you've allowed sin to be your master. Sin dominates you. Sin controls you. Do not let sin have dominion over me. And what you need to say is, God, I want to follow your path. I want to follow your plan. And I want you to steady my steps as I walk in your path in obedience. The word of God is wonderful because as I walk in the word, God gives me strength. And God gives me security as I follow faithfully in obedience. God's word will steady your steps. Caroline turned a year old and started running. I mean, it was like one day she'd just sit in my lap and watch football or baseball. And the next day she started walking and it wasn't long before she was running. And it wasn't long before she went from walking to running to climbing. She climbs everywhere. In fact, in a little while, I bet she'll be uh, she'll be in here after church, and she's going to climb up these steps, and then she's going to climb up these steps, and then she's going to try to get on top of that stool. And if she can get on top of that stool, she's going to get on top of the piano. And if she can get on top of the piano, she might do a backflip off and then go climb up the harp and then climb up onto the drum shield. And, I mean, she just loves to climb. She's busy. Her favorite thing to do right now, we have a little island in our kitchen, and she'll, she'll get up on one of the, the chairs. She'll climb up in the chair. It's hilarious to watch. She'll climb up in the chair. 
Then she'll climb up on top of the first part of the island. And then she's trying to climb up on top of the second part of the island. But then she doesn't know how to get down. So she'll get up there and she'll go, Mama, Mama, Mama. She just yells for mom or for dad. She gets up there, but then she doesn't know what to do. And there have been moments when we get there just in time before she does a somersault off the island in the kitchen. Any of you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. And see, there's a time we have to come. Even though she's in a treacherous spot, we've got to grab her. We've got to steady her steps. We've got to make sure that she doesn't stumble and fall. And I want you to know what the Bible is telling us here. As we walk with God, guess what God does for us? When we cry out to him, he steadies our steps. He reaches out his hand and walks with us through the treacherous paths of life. That's a beautiful picture of a faithful God as revealed in his wonderful word. The word of God steadies our steps. Psalm chapter 37 and verse 23. Wonderful truth and wonderful text of scripture. Psalm 37, 23. Listen to what the word of God says. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. You know what that means? God has a path for you and reveals that path to you. Established by him as you delight in the Lord and follow his will. The word of God steadies my steps. Number five, the word of God saves my soul. You say, well, wait wait a minute, preacher. Jesus saves your soul. Yes. Jesus redeems me. Christ died on the cross for me. Jesus forgave me of my sin, paid the price on the cross, and reconciled me to God. But how do I know about Jesus? I know through the word. You know, it's it's like saying your debt's been paid, but no one ever told you and you still live like a pauper. God paid our debt and he told us and he showed us in the word. That's the remarkable, wonderful nature of the word of God. It leads to salvation. The Bible says, what what is the, redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. We've seen his oppression multiple times as we've walked through this. There's some bad folks out to get him, right? But what is he? All the time he's leaning on God and he's saying, God, redeem me, rescue me from man's oppression. And now, so when we can turn to the word of God, we find deliverance from those around us. We find deliverance from the sin within us. Job found out when he said, as for me, I know my redeemer lives and at last he will take his stand upon the earth. No matter what comes my way, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to rest in him. And I'm going to say, he will rescue me. That's the God that we serve. He's revealed to us in the word of God. What do we find about in the word? We find out about Christ who gave himself up for us to deliver us from every lawless deed. To purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. God's word leads to man's rescue because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Where would you be if Christ had died for you? but no one ever told you. Where would you be? Just this week, we were at a conference, and we're talking to pastors. We were talking, if you remember a few months ago, I I interviewed Caroline Green. Caroline Green had been uh, a missionary in East Africa, places we, we can't even mention because of the safety and security issues to the International Mission Board. And I remember having a conversation with Caroline saying, you know, it's dangerous, it's treacherous. She said, but listen to what God is doing throughout the world. She said literally she and a friend of hers who was a missionary there would be standing on the street. And there'd be Muslims walk up to her. And they'd say, you should tell me about the one true God. And Caroline would look around and say, now, I don't don't know what you're talking about. Because it could have been, very very well could have been a Muslim wanting to come up to hear them say the name of Jesus so that they could do something vile or awful. And multiple times this would happen. And by the way, church, this is happening throughout the world in places that are persecuted. They don't have the revealed word of God. God is working in miraculous, marvelous, and incredible ways. These people would come up to her and say, no, you need to tell me about the one true God. You don't understand. There was a time, just last night, I had a dream. My friend had the same dream that I would see you and I would see your friend right here on this street corner and that I needed to come because I want to know about the one true God. So what do you do? You tell them about the one true God. 
You give him the word that reveals to him the truth that God has come in the form of Jesus Christ. And he is here to rescue us from sin. And folks, let me tell you something. We are sad, heartbroken over the situation in the Middle East, over the situation in places like China, in places like East Africa where they're persecuted for their faith. But let me tell you, when they have a faith, it's real. It's real. They're willing to die for what they know, for what they believe, because they have seen God work. The word of God reveals this truth to me. But we take this truth so lightly. God has rescued you. God has redeemed you. The very same God that's speaking and working in visions and dreams throughout the world has spoken once and for all through his word and through his son. And we have it at our fingertips, but we neglect its power. God, help us. We'll be judged for that one day. The reason that God speaks and works in places like that is they don't have the revealed word. What you'll notice is in frontier areas where the word of God is not readily available, the spirit of God is working and moving as similar to the book of Acts. But what we have before us is just as precious and just as sacred. The written, revealed, precious, perfect word of God that saves my soul. It leads me to Jesus. Number six. The Word of God is wonderful. It teaches me truth. The psalmist says here, Lord, make your face shine upon your servant. In the Old Testament, if you hear someone praying or saying, Lord, don't hide your face from me. We hear David pray that. When God hides his face from his people, it's a sign, a symbol, and a picture of God's judgment. But if God would make his face shine upon someone, it is a beautiful picture of the blessing and the favor of God. You see, when God hides his face, it's judgment. But when he shines his face, it's blessing. You see, make your face shine upon your servant. Why why does he want the blessing of God? Listen to this carefully. Make your face shine upon your servant so my bank account gets larger, so I have more influence, so I'm more popular and prominent. No, what does he say? Make your face shine upon your servant. Here it is. And teach me your statutes. What does he want? He wants to know the truth. He wants to know the truth of the Word of God. The truth. You you know, when Pilate was interviewing, interrogating Jesus, Pilate asked a question. What is truth? You know, the world is asking that same question today. What is truth? Jesus came. And said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. What is truth? Christ is truth. His word is truth and reveals the truth to us. So truth matters. Even today, truth matters. In fact, even more so today, truth matters. Number seven, the word of God is wonderful. Why? Because it creates compassion. It creates compassion. So six, seven things we've said here. First of all, the Word of God is wonderful. It imparts insight. It leads to longing. It leads to love. It steadies my steps. It saves my soul. It teaches me truth. And it creates compassion. Look at what he says here in this text. Verse 136. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. The Word of God does something to us that by nature we would never do. It teaches us to fear for the condition of other people's souls. We are naturally conscious of dangers to ourselves. We might naturally be conscious of dangers to those that are closest to us. But we are not naturally conscious of dangers of strangers that we don't even know. But the Word of God teaches us, leads us, compels us to have compassion for those in the farthest reaches of the world that don't know Jesus Christ. We are compelled to go tell them of a God who loves them, of a Christ who died to save them, of a Jesus who can rescue them, and the gospel that can redeem them. We must care for their souls. 
I'm compelled as a child of God to be compassionate for those that don't know Christ. Others come to oppress him. The enemies are all around him and he weeps, but he's not weeping for himself. He's weeping for them. Do you see the parallel in our world today? We weep. We gather in our churches and complain about all the problems in the world. And there are so many problems. The world is changing so rapidly. I don't think we're just in the last quarter. I think we're, you know, below the two-minute warning, okay? I think time is short and the days are desperate and people need Jesus. And we can gather around and complain about it and weep because of all the problems that we have. But we ought to be weeping for their souls. They're lost people. They act like lost people because they don't know God. They're in desperate shape because all the church does is complain. We gather together with our lights in a huddle and then we go out and we don't shine the light in the darkness. The light is brighter when the darkness is at its worst. We ought to be the church of God, taking the message of the gospel to our neighbors and to the nations across the street and around the world. That's what God has called us to do. I'm telling you something. When God rescues your soul, when he redeems you, when he saves you, he's going to give you a desire to see people saved, to see others come to Jesus. If you have no desire to see your loved ones come to Christ, how can you say you know him? If you have no desire to see the nations fall at his feet in worship, how can I say that I love Christ? If I love him, what's on his heart is going to be on my heart. What's on his heart? The nations, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, one day will bow at his feet in worship. And I want to be a part of that. Not just that I'm there, but others are there because I was here. Because this church is here. How can we say that we have the heart and mind of Christ through the wonderful word of God if we don't care less about the people who are lost, dying, and going to hell? It ought to break our hearts. My heart is broken by the condition of the lost, but it is even more broken over the condition of the church. Because by and large, the church couldn't care less except that it affects the way we live. That's it. That's it. I don't like this because the world is changing. I don't like this because liberal judges. I don't like this because the definition of marriage. I don't like this because all these things. I don't like this because it's a threat to me. What about what's going on in the world? What God wants to do in us and through us in these last moments that we have left? God wants his church to rise up, to be the church, to be his people, to have a message for the world, a message of truth, a message of compassion. A message of a God who loves them even though they're lost. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, And we've sat in the church for so long. We think that no longer includes us. I'm a good person now. I'm saved now. I've got my seat. I'm in Sunday school. And I'm a deacon. And I'm serving. And I keep the nursery. And I'm a preacher. And all these wonderful things. But we forget Christ loved us even while we were separated from him. Wicked and vile. Rebellious. He redeemed us. Charles Spurgeon says this, and I'm done. The saving of souls. If a man has once gained love to perishing sinners, and his blessed master will be an all-absorbing passion to him. The saving of souls, it will carry him away. That he'll almost forget himself in the saving of others. He'll be like the brave fireman who cares not for the scorch of the heat so that he may rescue The poor creature on whom true humanity has set its heart. If sinners be damned, let them leap over hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. 
imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least it will be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go there that has not been unwarned or unprayed for. That is our job as the church of God. We can't choose for somebody whether they go to heaven or whether they go to hell, but we can choose that they hear the message of the gospel. And they'll hear it. That's why God has us here. The word of God. The wonderful, remarkable word of God. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Church, just to be honest. When I prepared this sermon, I had no doubt. I had actually no idea. I had no idea that God would place that so heavy on my heart tonight. And I'm honestly don't know why he has. I don't know why he has. Boy, that last point just breaks my heart. And far too many churches are so busy criticizing the lost, they have no compassion for them. We wouldn't know how to reach them if they walked in these doors. God, help us. Maybe we as a church tonight just need to come to this altar and say, God, help us to love people. Jesus wept twice in the New Testament. Once over a loved one who died and the lack of faith that he saw in others. Secondly, so he wept over a person. He wept over a place. Jerusalem was scattered. We have to weep over the souls of people and over the lost condition of our city and our world. God, break our hearts. And so tonight, I don't even know Maybe you're out there actively sharing your faith every chance you get. Maybe you have a compassion for the lost. Maybe you're desperate to see souls saved, doing everything you possibly can to win them to Jesus. And like Spurgeon says, if they're going to go to hell, they're going to go to hell with our arms around their ankles, begging them to repent. Or maybe you're like me. And far too often you go about your business, go about your daily life, never interrupted by the desperate need of others. God. So whatever God says tonight, whatever he says to you, to me, to our church, to our people, respond, obey.